I'd like to thank the organizers for allowing me to present this work. My title is Why Fixed Costs Matter for Proof of Work Based Cryptocurrencies. My name is Rod Garrett from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and this work is joint with Martin Van Ort from the Bank of Canada. This paper is motivated by an event that occurred in May of 2018 when a spin off of Bitcoin called Bitcoin Gold was hacked in a rare 51% attack. Now, this was surprising to me because uh, when I was working at the New York Fed uh, several years earlier, I had written a blog post that uh, basically argued that Bitcoin, that was very unlikely that, that uh, attacks would occur on Bitcoin. I, and so I was very curious as to why this happened. And, and uh, I was uh, working at the Bank of Canada at the time uh, uh, on leave from, from UCSB and, and was speaking with Martin Van Ort. And we decided to investigate this. And we looked into what exactly happened in this attack on Bitcoin Gold. So just a little bit of background on Bitcoin Gold. Bitcoin Gold was born as a hard fork of the Bitcoin blockchain in October of 2017. It used a proof of work protocol that disabled the use of specialized equipment, uh, in particular uh, application specific integrated circuits, ASICs, chips for mining operations. And the goal was to achieve higher level of resilience through decentralized mining structure. Essentially, this was in line with uh, a, a comment that Satoshi Nakamoto made in, in the white paper, which is that every CPU is equally important. And this is articulated in, in, in BitcoinGold.org, which says that the goal was to bring Bitcoin back uh, to the people. So there was this general idea that uh, by having ASICs chips, mining was becoming too specialized that, that the average person couldn't mine and that we should uh, reinstate this essentially sort of somewhat democratic aspect of mining in Bitcoin gold. Well, what happened was there were several 51% attacks uh, in May uh, that occurred through May uh, 16 to 19 um, and uh, of 2018, uh, and they double spent around $18 million worth of Bitcoin gold. Now this resulted in a loss of confidence in Bitcoin gold and uh, a large decline in the exchange rate. In fact, uh, currently, it's only one sixth of what it was at the time of the attack, and the number of transactions has declined to less than one third. So, if we take a look at this chart, uh, what we're doing here is, is time zero is when the, the attacks on Bitcoin Gold began, and so you see that in, in the in the uh, days following the attack, the price fell uh, precipitously. In particular, it fell around 50 percent. And what you're seeing in the chart, by the way, is is the uh, uh, gold line is in terms of dollars, but then something might have been happening to cryptocurrencies in general. So the blue line is showing the price drop in terms of Bitcoin. So, so you can see that this wasn't a general decline in, in, in cryptocurrency prices, but that it was specific to Bitcoin gold. So the question uh, is, why was Bitcoin gold subject to a successful 51% attack while Bitcoin itself has not been? And what we argue in this paper is that understanding the role of fixed costs in cryptocurrency mining is crucial to answering this question and, and, and others. Uh, and so to introduce this analysis, I want to do a quick tutorial on mining. I, I, I believe that many people in this uh, audience will uh, know some of this, but it's, it's good to have a quick review and it's useful for articulating some of the aspects of, of what we do. So let me begin by just uh, talking about cryptocurrencies. Uh, they store transactions in blocks. And what I'm showing, so here I'm showing a sequence of blocks. Uh, and these blocks represent the history of all transactions that have occurred. And here we see a new block that includes a, a payment from Alice to Bob. And in the future, new blocks will be added. Uh, and now suppose that it occurs to Alice that she would like to use the coins that she paid to Bob uh, in order to buy something from Charlie. Well, she can't because the history uh, shows that she already spent those coins. So what she would have to do in order to respend those coins is to rewrite history. So she would have to go back in time before that transaction to Bob occurred and she could consider paying the coin to Charlie or maybe just to, just to herself, the A prime. Well, there are two obstacles to this. The Bitcoin rules uh, say one is that in order to create a new block, you have to solve a crypto uh, graphic puzzle, uh, and this requires mining power, and it's uh, uh, very difficult to do when there's a lot of mining uh, power associated with the network, and you have only a small amount of that mining power. It's very difficult to be the one that successfully solves this puzzle. Uh, and secondly, the protocol says that that 
uh, miners should follow the longest chain. Now there's a literature on whether or not strategically they have incentives to do that, but we'll take that as given. Uh, so they have an incentive to follow the longest chain. So even if you're able to solve a block uh, and embed this new transaction, it, 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 will be, it won't be followed. Okay, so the only way to get make it be followed is that you have to uh, uh, solve a successive number of blocks on top of that until your chain length matches the existing chain. In fact, it has to beat it. And once it does, your chain will become active and the old chain uh, will no longer be valid. So the question is, is it worth it? And so the, uh, what we do is we look at the benefits of doing uh, this double spend. So essentially that's gonna be measured in terms of how many coins you're, you're able to double spend. Uh, and then also the costs uh, associated with this double spend attack. Now, what are the, where do these costs come from? The costs come from the fact that miners, uh, when they validate blocks, they're paid uh, rewards uh, in terms of new coins uh, in, offered by the protocol and also some uh, rewards that come from transaction fees paid by users. And so if there is a uh, impact on the Bitcoin price as a result of the attack, as I showed, or sorry, the Bitcoin gold price perhaps, as I showed earlier, uh, then the revenue that you're gonna earn from your existing mining equipment is gonna drop. So there's gonna be a potential loss both during the time of the attack, which I'm showing here, and there's gonna be a, a potential loss that occurs after the attack. So what we have to do is we have to balance the uh, potential cost of the attack to the potential benefits. Now, there's a literature that has looked at Bitcoin mining uh, uh, in the past, and this literature doesn't capture much of what we're gonna say because this lit literature has not captured the importance of fixed costs. In fact, it's focused ex exclusively on uh, variable costs. So what I mean by variable costs uh, of mining is the electricity cost, or some people have uh, factored in depreciation of equipment as a flow cost, but they don't look at the actual fixed cost of, of setting up the mining equipment uh, and starting the mining operation. There are some exceptions. There's a paper by uh, Eric Budish that, that um, models uh, Bitcoin mining in terms of a flow cost, but, but there's a discussion, a verbal discussion, where, where he talks about some of the implications of uh, fixed costs, and, 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 and he's correct in what he suggests. Uh, and then Pratt and Walter, uh, they do look at fixed costs. In fact, there's only fixed costs in their model, but they don't uh, consider the implications for double spending attacks. So this, just by way of interest, is uh, an example of a spreadsheet used to create uh, a, a mining unit for, for Ethereum. Uh, and what it basically shows is that, you know, the cost of this, of the of the graphics cards and the cost of all the other equipment add up to a total that's pretty significant relative to the electricity costs of operating the rig. And uh, for example, uh, Pratt and Walter estimated that two thirds of the costs of Bitcoin mining are fixed costs. Okay, so once we incorporate fixed costs into the analysis, here are some of the results. So the first result uh, uh, is this basic idea of whether or not miners make zero profit. So Economists typically uh, think of, a, of a equilibrium. And so in, in an equilibrium in a market, profits should be driven to zero by uh, uh, entry and exit. And if there are only variable costs, then that will be true. Miners will make zero profits. If the price falls, then miners will simply leave and stop mining. Uh, and so they'll always be making zero profits. Now, if we introduce uh, fixed costs, then that's no longer true. Uh, in the long run, equilibrium miners make zero profits, but exchange rate fluctuations are going to cause them to make short-term gains or short-term losses. So miners, uh, do miners lose when the exchange rate drops? Well, no, if there are only variable costs. Again, if the exchange rate drops, some people just exit. In the case of fixed costs, you don't exit right away. Uh, so some people do uh, bear losses. Uh, does mining power exhibit downward rigidity? False in the case of variable costs, true in the case of fixed costs. That is, you don't leave right away if you have uh, fixed costs. Essentially, this is the idea that once uh, the price drops, you may not be covering all your costs anymore, but as long as you can cover some of your variable costs, you continue to mine. And then this idea of what's the cost of double spending attacks? Well, the fact that you've invested in a large amount of mining equipment in order to conduct your mining operation and the fact that a double spending attack uh, lowers the value of that mining equipment makes tax more costly. So that's another aspect that changes and we'll talk, or I'll talk a fair bit at the end about the implications of that. Okay, so 
Uh, before I go on into the formal analysis, I just want to say a little bit about an extension with uh, two cryptocurrency groups with transferable mining power. So I'm going to talk it, essentially give an, provide an analysis that treats a cryptocurrency in isolation. But of course, uh, people will realize that the mining uh, technology, the mining rigs that you build to mine uh, some cryptocurrencies can be transferred to mine different cryptocurrencies. And so we have to take that into account, whether or not that's possible. So that's very difficult with things like Bitcoin, but it's, it's much easier with the type of mining rigs that are used to mine Ethereum, for example. And what we show when we consider uh, groups with transferable mining power is that re the results are unchanged when the exchange rates co-move perfectly of the different cryptocurrencies in the group. But for tiny currencies with low exchange rate correlation, uh, transferability can eliminate the protection that fixed costs provide. Okay. Uh, oh, also, we will we'll, I'll provide you with some empirical results that uh, support the theory that I present. So let me now get into the theoretical model. So the main variable, or one of the main variables, is the exchange rate. So we denote that by S. So that's measured in terms of dollars per Bitcoin. Uh, and we abstract from other determinants of the exchange rate, uh, except for the fact that the exchange rate will change in the event of a successful uh, attack. There are a large literature that looks at what determines the value of cryptocurrency, such as Bitcoin. I've contributed to that literature. There are many others. The mining benefits per block solved, we're going to denote by B. So that's the, that's the reward you get when you solve a block. As I mentioned, that it includes new coins, newly minted coins that you get from the protocol and transaction fees. There's a peer period cost of mining, of operating a mining unit. That's epsilon. So that's the variable cost. There's also a fixed cost F. And crucially, there's also an, an alternative use value. So th the alternative use value is what you can sell your mining equipment for if you decide to stop mining. So think about something like Bitcoin, which is uh, mined with specialized ASICs chips. In that case, if you're not mining Bitcoin, those chips are not good for much else. And so the, the V, the alternative use value, would be close to zero, whereas some uh, uh, cryptocurrencies can be mined with graphics cards. Those are typically used for gaming, so they have a, a reasonably high alternative use value. And then some cryptocurrencies can be mined with a standard CPU, so those have an uh, alternative use value that's very high, close to the original fixed cost. Uh, mining power is denoted by the variable Q. That's the total mining power that's being uh, implemented on the network at, at, at any point in time. The mining capacity is QL. That might be different from the amount that's being used at the moment. And then we call the mining difficulty QD. That's the total amount, in, amount of mining power that's uh, required to deliver one block uh, per, per period. Finally, the cost of capital is R. That's, that can be thought of as the discount rate. So what we do is we model the arrival of solved blocks. So remember, everybody's mining. There's a certain amount of mining power out there. They're trying to solve a process that essentially has a random success rate. And so we're going to model this as a Poisson process where the arrival rate solved by one mining unit equals one over QD. So all the mining units are equally good. N of cap T denotes the stochastic number of blocks that are solved by a single mining unit that's operating for T periods. Uh, TK denotes the arrival time of the kth block. So the, uh, we can compute the expected present value of a single mining unit that lasts until period T, and that's the formula at the bottom of the slide. So the idea there is that this is uh, what's capturing the mining reward. So if you mine for, two, for, for T periods, N of T, as I mentioned, is the number of uh, blocks you're going to solve. T K is the arrival rate. But an expectation, um, if we uh, mine for T periods, we're going we're to be successful basically one over QD uh, times per period. And so this whole formula collapses to something quite, quite simple, right? This is just standard discounting, by the way. Um, so we get this formula, which gives you the expected present value of, uh, of operating a mining unit for two periods, okay? So we make one simplification in the main text of the paper, which is that we just imagine that the mining unit lasts forever. So we just take T to infinity. So then, that, then the mining revenue that you get, SB over Q minus the cost epsilon, uh, this is just a perpetuity. So it's just divided by the discount rate R, and then we subtract the fixed costs. This uh, simplification is easy to um, undo. 
And in the paper, we actually show exactly what happens to these calculations if we allow the mining equipment to only last for a finite number of periods. But for this presentation, I'm going to do the infinite life because it's just a little bit simpler. So it's profitable then to install new mining units until uh, the mining power in the network hits this level. So basically, the idea is that profit should be zero. And so we can solve for the optimum amount of mining power in the network that, uh, that, that, that sets these profits equal to zero. So that's our Q star. That's the e equilibrium amount of mining power in the network, which depends on the fixed cost. So the standard formula that ignores fixed costs would just be missing this term. So after an adverse shock uh, uh, to the exchange rate of L percent, so we think about a, so if we think about if the revenue used to be S times B, so that's dollars per Bitcoin times Bitcoins or whatever the cryptocurrency is, um, then we're imagining that if L was say 10%, that that uh, revenue is now only 90%. So if there's a 10% drop in revenue, we get 90% of the revenue. So after a shock, we're gonna be, out, that equilibrium condition is no longer you know, gonna hold. We're no longer at zero profits. But miners will continue mining so long as they're still covering fixed costs, or sorry, variable costs. So mining is still positive. Mining props are still, uh, uh, the, the, the revenue exceeds the, the, the uh, variable costs. And it's not better off just scrapping the equipment and selling it for the alternate reduced value. Okay. So suppose we're in an, e an equal equilibrium, then we can actually solve for a critical loss, a critical percentage drop in the exchange rate. Uh, at which point, at which point, someone would abandon mining. And that's theta. So it depends on uh, F through the overall type of amount of mining, and it depends on the alternative use value. So if we were to look at that in terms of a graphical picture, the idea is that let's first of all look at the case of uh, of general purpose hardware. So you can just use your CPU to mine. That's that's essentially the same thing as there being no fixed costs because any equipment you have, you can just instantly sell for what you paid for it. So in this case, mining just responds immediately to any loss in exchange rate. So if the exchange rate, uh, if the exchange, if there's a if there's any kind of a loss, this is the percentage loss on the horizontal axis. Mining power just drops proportionally. Um, in other words, if the, uh, the other extreme, if we look at something like Bitcoin mining, where the alternative use value of the mining equipment is zero, then there's no response to, a, to, to a, a, a drop in the exchange rate. So the percentage loss has to get all the way up to the point where uh, you're better off just stopping. You're no longer covering your variable costs at all. And then there's an intermediate case where you could sell your mining equipment for some alternative use value V that's between zero and F. So in this case, you don't respond when, when there's a loss, but once that loss brings you to the point that you're better off selling your graphics cards to gamers, you go ahead and do that. And so that same thing can be shown in terms of what's happening to the present value of your mining equipment. Losses in the, the drops in the exchange rate have no effect on you if you're using a CPU the present value of your equipment is, is always the same. You can always sell it for what you paid for, for it. Uh, otherwise, it can drop as low as V or it can drop all the way to zero in the case of an ASICS chip. Okay, so what are the implications of this? Well, the implications of this picture, if I go back to here, it says that when we see drops in the exchange rate, we expect to see immediate responses in the case of either no fixed costs or cases where there's fixed costs but high alternative use value say chips that are mined with uh, CPUs, uh, and we expect, expect to see very little response uh, to drops in the exchange rate for chips that are mined using uh, uh, ASICs chips, for coins that are mined using ASICs chips. So we can test this empirically, and that's what we do. So uh, what you're looking at here is a regression that we ran. So uh, we, we wanna look at the relationship between uh, changes in mining power, Q, we do this in logs, and changes in the exchange rate. The uh, panel unit root test suggests that the levels are, are integrated of order one, but first differences are stationary. So we run this in terms of first differences. And what, we, what would we expect from this regression? So this is the change in um, the amount of mining power that's used in the network. This is the change in the exchange rate. This is the change in the, in the max. So this is looking at, this is zero unless we, we reach the new max during the current period T. 
So in, the, in which case uh, um, we, we see that change. And then we also include a dummy variable for whether or not there are halving, halvings in block rewards. I won't go into what that's all about, but many people will understand that, that the block rewards that are, that are assigned by the protocol tend to uh, drop. They tend to have every certain number of uh, blocks that are awarded. So we control for that. So what would we expect according to our theory? Well, if, if, only variable, if there are only variable costs, so there are no fixed costs, or there are fixed costs, but the alternative use value is equal to fixed costs, or so something like CPUs, then we would expect delta Q to move perfectly with delta S, and this term would, would be insignificant. On the other hand, if fixed costs matter, then we would expect, we would expect that, that, that the change in Q would not be responsive to changes in uh, mining power, but, the, but it would only be responsive if the changing in, changes in mining power, uh, sorry, the changes in mining power would not be responsive to changes in the exchange rates, but the changes in mining power would be responsive if the change in exchange rates brought you to a new, a, a new max above the old max. Okay, so he, here's what we see in the regression. So what did we do here? We look at uh, these five different cryptocurrencies. What was the criteria? Well, the first criteria was that there's at least uh, $5 million in market cap for the coin. And if there was more than one, we picked the largest coin for this analysis. We wanted a three-year history uh, of both price and mining data. No significant change in the algorithm that was used. And we also wanted to span a variety of different protocols. So the protocols that are used here are SHA-256 for Bitcoin, uh, ETHash for Ethereum, Script for Litecoin, uh, Kryptonite for Monero, and X11 for Dash. And Bitcoin is the one that uses the ASIC chip, which is the most specialized. And uh, Dash uses a, a crypto a protocol, which is a combination of a number of protocols that I think is most conducive to say mining with something like a CPU, whereas Ethereum and some of these others are more intermediate. Ethereum can be mined, uh, is optimally mined well with graphic cards. So this would be the intermediate case. And so the results are pretty consistent with the theory. So as I mentioned, if fixed costs matter, we only expect the coefficient on the max, on the max change in the uh, changes in the exchange rate that bring you above the max to matter. And that's exactly what we see. The, uh, the changes in the exchange rate that aren't above the max have no effect, or at least an insignificant effect. Likewise, at the other end of the, of the spectrum with Dash, we see that there is a, a significant variation in just the regular changes in exchange rate um, uh, with the change in mining power, and, and changes above the max are insignificant. And then, and then Ethereum is somewhat uh, mixed, but that makes, makes sense because uh, Ethereum, again, has a protocol that has uh, a, a reasonable alternative use value. Okay, so now I can move on and talk a little bit about uh, what this all has to say about double spending attacks. So the formula I have here is showing you the per mining uh, unit cost of an attack that is successful after two periods to the attacker. So uh, what we have here is we have the two components that I mentioned early on in the talk. So first of all, there's going to be impact on the mining rewards during the attack. So again, the idea is that you're going to uh, do a double spend. So you're going to send a bunch of coins to an exchange and transfer them into something else. And then you're going to begin this process of trying to solve a sequence of blocks so that you can construct a chain that's longer than the existing chain that followed after you made your original transaction with the exchanges. So now during that time, there's going to be a number of blocks that are that are solved and and had you just continued mining uh, and not done an attack you would have been collecting rewards for the for the blocks that you would have, would have uh, solved during that period but instead you're doing all this in secret so you're not collecting those rewards and you're going to cash them all in afterwards when you have a uh, when you've created a new longer chain that you can amend to the to the cryptocurrency uh, blockchain but you're going to get those at a lower at a lower price because the attack will be public so there's this loss that occurs during the attack, and this is the, the a loss that occurs from, from then on. So if you've done, say, in expectation, you will have done some permanent damage to the currency. And so all the mining equipment that you have that's gonna mine Bitcoin from that period on is gonna earn a, a lower return, okay? There's the loss multiplied by the turn in this formula. So there's the loss that occurs during the attack, 
that depends on how long the attack takes and then there's the loss that occurs from then on okay so then what we have is we have a simple economic formula which determines whether or not we should undertake an attack so on the uh, uh, left what we have is we have a d which is the number of coins that the attacker is able to spend and essentially this is just saying that that the amount that they, they can earn by double spending coins has to be greater than the than the cost of the attack okay and then this is just that formula uh, uh written out in long form and this is useful because you can take a look if you if you go to the paper you can take a look and you can see how whether or not this threshold is met that is how many coins you want to spend to create a double spend attack depends on the other parameters in the model so that's interesting for thinking about say comparative statics or just the likelihood of a double spend of different coins so th this table is the in some sense the summary table for this presentation which which shows you what to make of this what what does introducing fixed cost how does it, that impact the way we should think about the likelihood of a double spend and so what this table does is if you think about moving uh, horizontally, uh, so things basically in the table, they're, they're getting, um, the attack is more costly as we move to the, from left to right and more costly as we move from top to bottom. So what we're showing in the top here is the percent drop in the exchange rate. So the bigger the drop in the exchange rate that results from your attack, the more costly it is for you to attack. Again, you have also this mining equipment if you kept using it, you would be earning an exchange rate for forever in the simplified model. But because you attack, you're, you're gonna lower that exchange rate, so you're gonna earn less. And these are just three possible estimates for what that drop is, 15%, 30%, 60%. So the bigger the drop, the, the, the more costly the attack is gonna be on that dimension. And then on this, on the vertical dimension, it's it's how valuable is the what's the value of the alternative use of the mining equipment so if you can sell your mining equipment for 100 percent of what it's worth then you don't really care if you damage the the value you can just sell the equipment um at least you don't care in terms of the long run because you'll sell the equipment after the attack uh, this is equivalent to there to there being no fixed costs. If there's an intermediate use value, then you're going to take a, a hit. And then if there's no alternative use value for the mining group, you take the biggest hit. So what we're showing in this table are the number of coins that you would uh, need to be able to double spend. And so you could think of this in the context of, say, Bitcoin. Um, well, we show what the parameter choices are here. So you can ask yourself whether or not those are reasonable. And in fact, there's a PDF, excuse me, PDF spreadsheet in the paper that you can use to type in your own parameter values that you think apply to a particular coin and see what the, the results are. But this is showing you the number of coins that you would have to spend in order for it to be worth it, to be able to successfully spend in order to be worth it uh, to engage in a double spending attack. So the larger this number is, the harder it is to do an attack. So for example, uh, according to the values we've chosen here, uh, in this sort of best case scenario where you're using say CPUs and there's only a small impact on the coin price you would only need to use 60 spend double spend 60 coins but in say something like bitcoin where there's a, a zero alternative use value and maybe there's a large drop a 60 percent drop you'd need to double spend 530,000 coins so most people don't have 530,000 coins and even if you had 530,000 uh, say bitcoins you would have to find an exchange that was willing to take those from you uh, and if an exchange took an order from you, a sell order from you that large, it would have lots of uh, implications. They might uh, require a, a longer uh, confirmation period. It would probably have an impact on price, immediate, immediate impact on the exchange rate price and so on. So it'd be much di more difficult to do a double spend of that size. Now, what we show in the bottom table is what happens uh, when Bitcoin uh, rewards have gone to zero. So the only thing you now get from the protocol, so the only thing you now get are transaction fees. And the reason we think this case is interesting is because many people have talked about whether or not Bitcoin is doomed once rewards fall to zero, once block rewards fall to zero. And so there is a, a BIS study, for example, that, that said once rewards are zero, it could take months before Bitcoin payment is final unless new technology is employed. So the idea is that once rewards fall to zero, because Bitcoin will be so susceptible to attacks in their analysis, which ignores fixed costs, 
they believe that uh, exchanges and people who accept Bitcoin will have to set the confirmation period to be incredibly long in order to protect themselves. So in other words, what we find in our analysis is that if Bitcoin rewards drop to zero, so you only get transaction fees, then in this case where there are no fixed costs and a low impact on the exchange rate, you would only have to be able to double spend four Bitcoins in order for an attack to be profitable. In other words, attacks would be very profitable and, and so you would need to extend the confirmation period drastically. Well, what our analysis says, however, is that, well, no, Bitcoin uses specialized ASICs chips so the alternative use val value is zero. So we're down on this bottom row. And so if there is a 15% or even a larger uh, uh, drop in the exchange rate, so I think if Bitcoin was successfully double spent, there would be a bigger drop in the Bitcoin price than 15%. But in any event, the idea is that you need on the order of, of 10,000 uh, Bitcoins in order to be willing to uh, engage in a successful double spend, even when the block rewards are zero. So this is really one of the big punchlines of the paper. And we think that there's, you know, it's I think maybe a little bit of irony here that, that in some sense, many people have criticized uh, this movement towards ASIC mining in Bitcoin. Again, for the reasons that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, that, that there's a sense in which this is, is, is not very, uh, you know, I use the word democratic. What I mean by that is that it, not everyone is able to participate in the mining process. But in fact, we're arguing that this special feature of Bitcoin uh, makes it safer than virtually any other cryptocurrency, more secure. So now to conclude, uh, let me just point out that what we did in this paper is we accounted for fixed costs, or we, point, we showed that accounting for fixed costs and alternative use value of that equipment is crucial to understanding both mining behavior, that is how changes in mining power vary with uh, changes in the mining in the, in the cryptocurrency price, uh, and we showed what the implications of this are for double spending attacks. Uh, what I call the basic truth, or what we call the basic truth, which is that ASIC mining, which involves fixed costs and a low alternative use value, reduces the profitability of double spending attacks, makes the currency more secure. Um, properties of mining hardware and the historical exchange rate path have important implications for the number of block confirmations one should require for accepting cryptocurrency payments. So that's uh, some guidance that comes out of the paper. And as I mentioned early on, our analysis extends to transferable mining power. So, so we look at this and other robustness checks in the paper. And so I would invite you to look at the paper to, to, to discover more uh, about what we have to say. So thank you uh, very much for your time.